Hey guys, Jason Samkovic here, Traditional Bow Hunting Wilderness Podcast. We're going to be talking about planning an out-of-state hunting trip. What are the steps you got to do? How do you go about doing this? How do you find the right place? We're going to cover it all for you in this series, and uh, we're going to break it down. So stick around, we're going to get it rolling for you. Okay, so to start this off, we got to figure out these things. A couple things, to, before you even can make any of the planning, everybody wants to dive right in, um, start figuring things out. Well, you got to know a few basic things before you do. When do you want to go? What is the plan for this? Do you want to go early season, pre-rut, rut, late season? When do you want to go? Because this is going to make huge determining factors of the places you want to hunt, especially when you get into the mapping stages and things like that. It's important that you know when you're planning on being there so you know where to go. So you got to figure that out. When are you planning on going? Uh, September, October, November, December, January, uh, February. Don't forget, there are rut hunts that happen in November, rut hunts that happen in December, rut hunts that happen in January, and even rut hunts. You can hunt the rut in February down in, in Alabama. It's, it's rut down there in certain parts during February. So you have to figure this out um, and know where you or when you want to go. Next one is how far do you want to travel? Okay, uh, that's going to be a determining factor. It may just be one more state over where you're only two hours or three hours away, or you might be thinking um, living in Michigan and heading to Alabama, which is, you know, could be 17 hour drive to get down there. You know, that thing, 15, 17 hours or heading out west, any of that kind of stuff. You have to consider how far you're willing to go so that you can plan accordingly when you get into this stuff. Also, who is going with you? Are you going alone? Nothing wrong with going alone. I do a lot of trail hunting trips on my own, a ton of them. So this is, you know, actually going by yourself is not a bad idea. So don't rule that out. And also keep that in mind because if you plan on going with, say, one other guy or two other guys, and if they back out on you, which happens a lot, I don't think you should not make this trip. You should definitely go. Go solo. It's an amazing time. You get to hunt harder than you ever did before. You get to learn more. Um, it's, you know, it's maybe a little lonely, but you got cell phones, video chat, call your family, whatever you want to do from camp each night. But I do not think that skipping this, if somebody can't go or if they won't go or they back out, I don't think you should not do this hunt. Do the hunt. I'm telling you, I have done many, many solo trips for 10 days at a time, and they're, they're amazing hunts. They're well worth it. Trust me. So don't let that be a deciding factor, but it's good to know up front um, and when, what the game plan is, especially if you start getting into this stuff and you got to divide gear, who has what, um, and it makes life a lot easier, especially if you're camping. Next thing is, are you going to camp or are you going to be in a hotel? How are you going to, what are your accommodations going to be that you're planning on doing for this trip? It's going to be a big factor. If you're doing a late season hunt in Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, something like that, you're planning on camping in a tent, you better be prepared for that okay that's a whole different animal you could be down into sub-zero and um you know uh, you know temperatures in there teen temperatures during the day and sub-zero at night you know so you could be in some real trouble if you're not knowing how to prepare for that stuff so it's important to figure these things out um hotels are also an option okay so you got to figure these things out if you're doing hotels i recommend a hotel where you have access from your vehicle straight into your door don't get to hotels where you get to go in through the lobby, up the elevator, and then into your room that way. You want a hotel where you can park right there and then unload your truck and walk directly into your door. That's the kind of hotel you want to make reservations at. When you Google it, you'll see it, but it's so much easier being able to do that with gear than it is trying to bring it up there, especially if you're hunting out of the back of a pickup. You're not leaving um, stands and sticks and gear in the bed of your truck at a hotel at night. You're going to need to lock that stuff up or bring it in with you, so having access a straight shot right into your hotel room big deciding factor there so you want to make sure you know what your accommodations are are you going public or private 99% of what I do public land okay that's it. actually I would say 100% of what I do and 100% of everything I've done for the past 15 years is basically been um, public with the exception of I think it's been about eight or nine years ago that I was hunting Curtis and Trina's in Missouri and it was uh, it was public land but um, un controlled basically public land or private land so it was private but um since then i don't hunt anything it's all public 100 percent public so you have to decide that i'm assuming you're going public if you're going private though it does not have to be expensive you don't have to use outfitters you don't have to do that stuff you just got more research that you're going to have to do making phone calls looking at uh, on x finding properties finding whose names are on those properties getting phone contact information calling them up you can still do this 
from out of state, it's just a heck of a lot harder. Um, and there might be some money involved in that. You call up these landowners and say, hey, I'd like to come out there and hunt your property. You know, we'll give you 500 bucks to be there for a week, that kind of a thing, something along those lines. Or go with an outfitter or uh, somebody who, who leases the property, that's an option. We're talking public, but you can do private, it's gonna be the same exact way for you. So you gotta answer these things first. Write them down on a piece of paper. When you wanna go, how far you'll travel, kind of a five hour, 10 hour, three hour, what your distance you wanna go is, who is gonna go with you, whether you're gonna camp or a hotel, we're assuming public. Once you have that, you have the foundation. Now we get into the next steps. All right, next step on your agenda here is going to be picking the state. This is an important one here because there's a lot of determining factors. And if you get this one wrong, you're in a world of hurt. So this is a huge step and it requires multiple parts. But picking the state, are there tags available that are OTC over the counter? Okay, do you have to draw for them like Iowa, Kansas, things like that where you're going to have to put in and hopefully you get drawn. And if that's the case, usually you've got to put in earlier. Like right now as you're seeing this, you might even be a little late. Kansas had to be put in in April. And if you didn't put in during the month of April, you, you're, you're not going to get it. So, but you have to, uh, and you may not get it anyway. It's a draw state. But point being, you for those draw ones, you would have to put them in OTC that over-the-counter tag, that's one that you can get pretty much any place you want to, where you can just buy them right online or buy them at a shop when you get there in a sporting goods store. That's usually the best bet. Over-the-counter is great. That's my preferred way. The draw tags, um, they can be hit or miss, and I got mixed feelings on that. Personally, yes, like you could, people are like, well, why don't you put it in for Iowa? Iowa, I think you're on a three to five year rotation and no offense to that, but if I'm going to hunt a place out of state, I want to be able to go back every year so that I can keep, if I'm going to invest any time into a particular public land place, I want to be able to go back the next year and capitalize on what I learned a year before. And on year three, I want to put what I learned in year one and year two in, into progress also and make them work for me. I don't want to hunt a place where I can hunt it one time and then I may not be able to be there for four or five more years. I'm not interested in that. So for me, over-the-counter tags, OTC, that's the important one. So um, check and make sure that state has them if that's important to you. And it has to be over-the-counter tags and then doe tags too. Some places may not give you extra doe tags. Um, so, and those are real handy. You know, they come in real good, especially in your first year, okay? You're out of state in the first time in a place your odds are not as good as they are six consecutive years after that. So knowing that you may not get the buck that you're looking for, having the option to take a doe so you're bringing meat home and stuff like that, or if you're like me and you don't care if it's a buck or a doe, um, that's an important one. So you want to make sure they have doe tags available. Both those tags and those doe tags are available during your trip. Many places are very tricky. Like say, for example, uh, Georgia. I think Georgia's deer season is from... Like, let's say it starts October 1st and it goes till January 15th, but every WMA has their own bow hunts, their own gun hunts. They're at different times. This weekend's gun only. This weekend's for bow. This two weeks is for bow. Then this one's a gun. They got all these variations and things. So it's important that you know that this stuff is available for you to hunt on your place you want to go during your trip. Okay, this is an important one. You have to read the regulations and figure this stuff out. So you pick a state that you think, based on this, that has it, and then you got to start diving deeper. Next thing, do they have good public land? You're going to figure out, You're going some of these things will bounce you back and re-answer your questions. So during your trip, are these available? You may not know that. In Georgia, it may be. But when you go to good public land and you start looking at WMAs, you may find WMAs that do and don't allow you to be there during the time that you're planning on scheduling your vacation. So it may or may not work. Alabama, same way. A lot of southern places are like that. So it may or may not work to your advantage. You have to find that public land that's in there. Very easy. This is all research stuff on the internet. All Everything on here, this whole, everything you're seeing here is, is done through Google, okay? You can just Google and you can pick your state and you can say, for example, Alabama. Alabama hunting seasons, okay? And it's going to give you this information. It's going to tell you what's there. Can non, do non-residents have the same season? Uh, are they restricted in other ways? You'll figure that out. 
good public land. You can go public land in Alabama. It's going to pop up and show you all over the state where they all are. Pick the ones that you like and the area that you like and you can research it and dive in and go deeper. You can pull up the regulations for each WMA and find the dates, the rules, the regulations, everything there for you. Some states are much easier. For example, if you go to uh, Missouri, which I honestly don't recommend Missouri, okay? I, I've been going there now for 20 years, and I'm telling you, Missouri is the most overrun place I've ever been to now. It is disgusting the amount of people there, and like I said, it's kind of on our to check off pretty soon list and just not go to anymore. So just keep that in mind. Um, or go if you want and give it a try, because like I said, I think our days there are a little more numbered, so it isn't going to affect me at all. Um, but Missouri... Um, it's a lot simpler. It's basically one set of deer hunting rules pretty much throughout the whole state for the most part. Where a lot of other states are very broken up and mixed, so you got to watch that. But you need to find a good public land It's on there, okay? Well, how do you know if it's good public land? Well, find a chunk that you're interested in and then start hitting some of the forums. Start reading what other people have said. Google, you know, um, you know deer hunting on uh, Happy Days WMA. And then you'll see a bunch of posts and forums and topics and things that come up on it that will tell you if there's good hunting there. You'll start seeing pictures of the deer that were killed there. The information is out there for you with a little bit of Google. That search bar in Google is a very powerful tool. Do not get complicated with it. Type in your exact question. Is there good deer hunting on Happy Days WMA? Type that exact phrase. That's your question. Watch what comes up and start browsing through and reading the stuff. It will help you and tell you. Um, this one right here. This one. Oh, this is a, a catcher one here, okay? Do they allow baiting? This one is tricky. I will never, never hunt a state for deer that allows you to bait on public land. Okay. I deal with that in Michigan right now. It's technically banned, but I bet it's back every time they ban it. People here, you know, they get their panties all in a wad. Within a year or two, it's right back to baiting again. So I live in, in an area with baiting, and it's, it's horrible. So I would always avoid. No, if they, if they allow public baiting, do, I'm not going there. I, I do not recommend going there if you can bait on public land. Uh, just not even worth it. Um, but that's up to you. Um, pressure. How much pressure is there? How much deer hunting is there? Again, when you do your Google search and you do it on is, you know, is there good deer hunting on Happy Days WMA, you're going to start to learn about whether it's good hunting. You're going to learn about the pressure that's on there. You'll learn about some of the buck quality and the deer numbers. You can also get this information right here. You can actually get all of these, everything here, by calling the DNR, okay, Department of Natural Resources for that state, or whatever they call it, you know, game wardens, but you go to the DNR, get their field office number for that particular place, call them up, talk to a wildlife biologist and tell them you're thinking about coming there from out of state to hunt. How is it hunting on Happy Days WMA? How is the pressure on there during the rut or pre-rut or whenever you're going? How's the buck quality of this there? What's the deer numbers and deer density like? He's going to know every one of these. Restrictions, okay? Restrictions. Another big one for you crossbow guys, okay? More and more states are allowing them, but not every state does allow crossbows. So if you are a crossbow hunter, then you want to watch for restrictions. If there's restrictions everywhere. You need to read the rules or ask them when you're talking to them. But there are interesting little tidbits and things that you have to pay attention to um, when it comes to this stuff, what you can and cannot do. Uh, for example, um, I see a lot of people that are hunting hogs in South Carolina during, um, you know, I see it on forums, I see it on Facebook, I see it on this stuff. They're hunting hogs in South Carolina during small game season with bulls. Okay? You cannot do that. It's illegal. If you read the, the rule book in there, their restrictions say in South Carolina during small game season, you cannot have a broadhead in your quiver. Okay? It says that specifically. Blunt tipped arrows only for small game, no broadheads. It says that exact line right in there. So if you were going there and you're going to be hog hunting, in South Carolina during small game season and you're going to use a bow, you legally are breaking the law because you cannot do it because of restrictions, okay? Some states will allow crossbows. Some states only allow crossbows during gun season. Some states, there's variations everywhere. If you come to Michigan for a gun hunt here and you were coming here and you were expecting to hunt down in this, in southern Michigan 
In the southern part of it, you were planning on bringing your 30-odd 6 or your 308 or your uh, 6.5 Creedmoor or something to hunt deer with, you're going to be in a world of trouble because we have shotgun zone or straight wall cartridge restrictions in many parts of the state. So everywhere there is, you're going to have to watch out for what restrictions are there that can come up to bite you. All right. Every place is different. Every state has them. Every WMA has them. It takes a little research. This is your big part of the planning process, all right? This is going to narrow it down, but when you've done all this, you are going to know that you are going to go to Happy Days WMA in uh, um, Happy Land State, okay? That's where you're going. So you'll have this figured out to what you're going to do and where you're going to go will be solved at this stage. But these are all the things that you need to figure that out. You can Google it, research it, which I recommend doing, but that phone call to a DNR, the wildlife biologist there too, will answer 90% of this in a 10 minute conversation as well for you too. So make sure you take advantage of that. But this is all important part of picking that state. All right, hold on, we'll be right back. All right, next thing we gotta start doing is narrowing down the properties that you're looking at on there. So you picked out this Happy Days WMA, covers some, you know, you got, uh, I don't know, 80,000 acres or 50,000 acres, whatever it is you're working with. We need to start narrowing it down. Again, this is going to be dependent kind of on when you're going. If you're going early and late season, you need to be thinking about foods, you know, what foods are going to be there. You're going to be hunting that kind of stuff. You're going to be hunting transitions. Uh, you want to make sure there's solid bedding. When I say solid, I mean known bedding areas there. Um, where you, you're because you're not scouting this, you're not going to be there preseason to scout it. So, you want to make sure that this is solid 100% bedding kind of areas. Um, and you can tell where the bedding areas are, where the food is on a map, where the transitions and travel is, so that you know how to do that. Because that early and late season patterns are going to be bedding to food, real simple. Okay, if you're going during the rut, you want to know where the funnels are going to be at, where the travel is, where doe bedding is going to be, uh, the terrain features are going to force those deer to move through there because they're going to be covering a lot of ground, um, this kind of stuff. You need to know and pick your properties as you narrow them down based on what it is that you're after. So when you start diving into the maps, which we'll talk about, these are things to keep in mind. Also, are you looking for urban areas? Urban areas have got a lot of great hunts. There's a lot of fantastic, even public land areas that are inside of urban areas that are overlooked. There's some, you know, if you're going after big bucks, um, urban areas are one to seriously look at. I'm not a big buck hunter. I would rather have more room to roam and take a smaller deer um, than I am chasing 200 or 180 inch deer in specific places. But if that's you and you're after those specific targeting monster bucks, Urban area trips, these are fantastic ones. Um, you're going to be hunting the hill country, you know, things like that in the Midwest, that kind of stuff. Pennsylvania, um, you know, Kentucky, Tennessee, um, you know, Missouri, Kansas, a lot of that hill country things. Are you going that route? You're going for ag or agriculture, you know, places that have got a lot of egg fields and things like that mixed into there. A lot of places, even on public land, public land is leased out to farms to provide corn, soybean, um, alfalfa, things like this for hunters to be able to have access to hunt. And then that food is, you know, this land is leased to farmers and they actually have real working farm lands on them that are phenomenal in that agricultural areas. Are you going for swamps? You're looking for big woods. What are you looking for? You need to figure this out so you can narrow down that property so you can really start focusing on these things. But you need, you want to know this before you start diving into the mapping stuff because it's going to help you know what you're looking for. You know what you're after here. You know what you're after here and you know what types of areas work best for you and what you're focusing your attention on. Okay, this is an important step. All right, next step you got to do, cyber scouting. You can do this online. There's a lot of different ways. I've covered this in full detail in my bow hunting whitetails course and I've covered it in, in free videos on YouTube. Not getting too detailed into it. Pick your favorite one, whether it's my topo, um, Cal Topo, Onyx, whatever it is, but you need to dive in. You need both aerial topo or aerial photographs and you know satellite images you want, and you also want top or topographical maps. You want the two of them. You need to know how to use topo maps, which I cover in that course, and you need to know how to use aerial photographs the right way and how to use that history function in like Google Earth and stuff like that. Those are all great features. Again, I've covered it a bunch in my courses and, and free too if you don't want to dive into that course i do it for free also and in a lesser extent for you 
but cyber scouting, okay, this is an important one. This is your next step. This is the big one. You got to dive into these areas. You are going to need to look for access. Keep in mind this whole process is cyber scouting thing. I, here's, here's my ballpark, okay, for, for two, let's just call it per person, for you, for just you in the spots you want to hunt. On that, for that one week trip, it is going to take you a minimum of 15 hours, okay, this will, of cyber scouting for you to figure out the spots that you're going to need um, that are going to be gold mine spots you're going to find for a week of hunting. Figure 15 hours of actual cyber scouting time. That is going to let you really break that down. But don't worry because you're not trying to do 15 hours in one day or in one week. you got plenty of time. you got months before this trip's going to happen usually. So you got time to figure this out, um, especially if you're planning it now. So, But I would figure out about 15 hours to really narrow down and dive in and tear that place apart. You want to know about access. You want to know where the food is going to be for the time of year you're going to be there. Where they're going to be bedding at in relationship to that. Are they rut only beds? Is it early season and late season? Where they're using historical beds? Um, the travel that they're going to be using to get around. The terrain features are a key one. You know, and then what I do is when I make these maps, I use Photoshop. You can use anything you want to, but highlight them. Even in Paint or some of these other free software things that are out there, uh, make a screenshot of that map in a specific area that you're targeting in that map and then start making layers, coloring them in, um, highlighter basically. Take a highlighter like you would on a map and put a pink here and let the pink be funnels. Pink here, pink here, you know, but you're doing it on your computer right there on, on your um, laptop or whatever. But you want to make a layer um, or mark so you know which where the funnels are going to be, where the no-go areas for deer are going to be, where the saddles are, the benches, transitions, waterways. You want to use all these because these are going to help you establish how they're moving around with travel from bedding to feeding and what terrain features they're using. You want to look for the micro transitions along that way, which these you probably won't until you get really good at it. You're not going to see these on a map, but you'll figure them out when you get on the ground. You want to know where the hubs are, the intersections, corners, uh, three ways. Three ways, again, all this stuff is in that course, but the three way, what I call those, those are like a perfect example of one would be an inside corner. So you got an inside corner of a field here. Here's a field. This right here is what I would call up here would be a three way. So you have travel that's going to go through the woods here. Travel is going to go through the woods here, and they're also going to cut this corner if that corner is grassy enough, high enough, and has some cover. So in a lot of those fields, that edge is pretty thick, or if it's corn or whatever the case is, wherever you're hunting at, but you have these points here where they're going like this. Okay, well, that's a three-way setup. If I can get myself in a position here where I can be here and I can shoot here, shoot here, and shoot here, it's what I call a three-way. Okay, and they happen, that's just a simple example in a field, but they also happen with terrain features in the woods too. Um, anything that can improve your odds. But basically find these terrain features that are in there, mark them down on a map so you know where they are. I use layers. Layers lets me turn on and off every one of these things as I want to look at it. But make one map, okay, take a screenshot, make a screenshot, and then just make a copy of it, okay? On it, copy that, or make another copy of that screenshot, Pull that one up and on that one, label it funnels or change the name of it to funnels and mark all the funnels. Then grab another one of that original screenshot, mark all the no-go areas, okay? Um, no-go areas are places where deer will not be during daylight. Mark them right off because of people pressure, openness, water, whatever it is, mark them off. Make another copy of that screenshot. That one called saddles and mark all the saddles. Same thing, benches, all these terrain features, mark them all on there. That way you can lay them out and you can look and you go, this one's got this here and it has a funnel here and it's got this bench right here and it's all these things are to, and you can start putting things together and really narrowing it down. Okay, so that's how you're going to cyber scout this to get you what it is you're looking for. Then you're going to start marking possible stand sites. And those are going to be, you know, you're going to put them right on that map, put them on there as an X, a star, whatever you want, however you drop a tree stand thing in on X, whatever your method is, but start marking those. The goal on a basically, because keep in mind, you got all kinds of wind directions, okay? So we got basically, there's eight different wind directions, technically speaking, how we're looking at it. 
if you got eight wind directions, say you're going to hunt in the morning and in the evening, not doing all day sits, you're going to be there for seven days. That 14, uh, 14 stand sites that you need could be based on eight different wind directions. When you take this stuff into consideration, I'm going to say that when you're figuring all this on a, on a uh, seven day hunt, you're going to want to probably have, I would say that you're going to want to have at least 30 to, let's just call it 40. You want 40, sorry, I'm trying to sideways here, but 40 stand um, stand positions marked, okay? 40 stands is what you're looking for is the goal. If you got 40 of them, you're going to be thinking wind direction when you're figuring these out, but having 40 of them is going to be a gold mine setup for you and give you a good starting basis. Now, when you get there, you may get there and find that 10 of them are no good, you don't want to go in and scout them all. I don't. I don't go in and scout them when I'm there. When I get there, I land, I set up camp, and I hunt. And I head into these spots. We're going to cover this in a minute. But try to get yourself at least 40 of these on that property per person-ish. You know, that's that's a good number. Because right now you have the time. you got months before it's happening. Spend the time at Cyber Scout. Get yourself 40 solid stand locations. Um, they don't need to be spread miles apart. It's probably good to have... Um, you know, uh, if you got one, let's say you got an acre size area, um, in that acre size area, it's good to maybe have three or four in it, or not acre size, I'm sorry, um, three or four in that, uh, um, you know, inside of that square mile area, have three or four stands right in that one spot. Depends on how big a property you're going to, but having walkable stands, where if you walk into stand site number three, and you get there and you're like, man, this sucks. I don't like it. You don't have to go all the way back out, get to the car, and drive to another one. You can go to stand four or stand five or stand six or stand two. Is somewhere within walking distance of a, a half mile, three quarters of a mile from where you are. Or you can just beeline right over to it. Having that option is good. So, But I would figure out about 40 stands. Some people are going to think I'm absolutely crazy. You do it your way. If you only want to have 10, have 10. Whatever you want to do. This is how I set up for an out-of-state hunt and uh, if you've hunted with me before you know you know it you've seen my maps because the people I hunt with I send these maps that I make to them so they have this information with them so um, but this is exactly what I do this is how I, I break it down I already know exactly where we're going before I even get there so that's cyber scouting this is step eight this is the one that takes some time but it's very beneficial and take longer. If it takes you 30 hours, let it be 30 hours. Don't give up on it. Just keep diving in and finding those minuscule places. It's going from a big picture to really narrowing it down. I mean, you really want to get down to the nitty gritty where you're down there and your whole screen is only showing, you know, you're only showing a, a 200 yard area by 200 yard area as you're really fine tuning. That's where you start seeing the micros. Okay, that's where you see the micros and the hubs and the intersections and all that. That's where all that stuff really starts coming into, into focus on your screen when you dive in real close on there. So spend some time on the cyber scouting. Okay, step number nine. Now we got to figure out your gear. You already got everything else figured out. You got your maps, your stand sites, you know what state you're going to, tags, you know, all that stuff. Um, and so all of that stuff is ready. Now it's time to figure out your gear for this trip. Okay, this is the fun stuff. This is the, the things. You got to figure out your clothing. If you're one of those guys that has one set of Sika gear or one set of Kuyu or First Light and that's your hunting stuff, are you going to hunt in that for seven straight days? Are you going to have maybe need some other stuff? Uh, so you got to figure that out. Do you, are you going to bring three pairs of pants, five pairs of pants? Are you changing your clothes every day? Are you putting them in an Ozonics bag? Are you bringing an air purifier or thingamajobber with you to do this? Are you going to run to a laundromat? What, what are you going to do with what gear you have? Figure the clothing out. It's one of the reasons I hunt in this. I hunt in everyday clothes. I don't own hunting clothes per se anymore at all. I hunt in the same stuff in my closets. Done videos on it, talked about it many times in podcasts. I don't wear hunting clothes. Um, but the one I do, and I highly recommend you consider for this trip, is going to be rain gear. Okay, And there's people that say, I don't hunt in the rain and I have no problem with that. Understand, when you're on an out-of-state hunt, good odds are that it's going to rain. I have been on seven-day hunts where it's rained for five days straight, where you live in your rain gear. Okay, It's miserable, but you got to deal with it. It is what it is. Rain gear is a very important piece of clothing. There are lots of rain gears out there. I'm not going to tell you what you should or shouldn't get, but I will tell you from my experience in trying all of that stuff, if you can swing Kuyu or First Light 
or even maybe that new Stone Glacier stuff I haven't tried out myself, but Kuyu or First Light I have personal experience with. They are by far the best rain gears I've ever had. Kuyu Chew Catch, love it. Uh, First Light Boundary Storm Pant, or First Light Boundary Storm Tight Pants are my absolute favorite rain pant ever. Uh, the Kuyu Chew Catch Jacket is probably my favorite go-to jacket, and I also love the uh, First Light um, Vapor Storm Tight Jacket as well too. But that the First Light and Kuyu rain gear, top of the line. Okay, it's not cheap, but I, it, it's worth it, in my opinion. It's the only piece of technical high-end gear I think that everybody should own. I don't care if you have uh, Timberland pants or Sitka Fanatic, or I, I don't even know what half this stuff is. Okay, I, none of that stuff really does anything for me. I love the Timberline pants from Sitka because they got waterproof butt and knees. I wear those on my Kansas trips all the time because I'm sliding up and down ravines, um, so they come in real handy. And I like the waterproof knees for when I'm boning animals out. Clothing is your choice, whatever it is, but get that sorted out. If you don't want to swing that high-end uh, um, uh, rain gear, I don't know if they still make it. They might. Uh, mine's pushing six or seven years old now. I still wear it almost daily um, this time of year. When I, I use it when I'm pressure washing still, but I've hunted out of it many times. But Heli Hansen Impertech rain gear. You can get the set. Again, I haven't bought it in forever, and I don't even know if they still make it. But if you can find it, Heli Hansen Impertech Rain Gear is a fantastic 100% kind of a rubber rain suit gear setup. The vented right works good. If the temperatures are below 55 degrees, they're fantastic. You start getting above that, it can get kind of sweaty in there. And uh, But anything below 50, 55 degrees, it works fantastic, and it's 100% waterproof. And you're looking at like a hundred and I, I don't know now. I, I don't know what the cost is, but it's a lot less than what it cost for Kuyu or First Light. But if you can swing the Kuyu or First Light, that's my recommendation. But clothing is one you need to figure out. Okay, boots. Maybe you have one pair of hunting boots. Not a bad idea to have a second pair. You step in the water, you kill an animal and it runs in the water and you got to go through the water. Now you're soaked. It's not like you have a way to dry them out very easily. Um, you know, in camp or at the hotel or things like that, putting them over the vent. We've tried everything, sticking the hair dryer in them while we, uh, you know, while we were doing whatever we're doing for an hour and then putting in the other one and hoping that the, the coil in the back doesn't burn out and you got pulled out and wait a while. And it's a, it's a nightmare. Bring more boots. Okay, bring two or three pairs. Every, every trip I go on, I got two pairs of hikers, a pair of knee-high rubber boots, and a pair of hip boots. Always in my trailer. That's why I take a trailer. Okay, which why we ha it gives us the options to carry this stuff. But figure out your, your clothing setup. If you're camping, camp gear. Okay, I've done many podcasts, many videos on this stuff. They'll give you some pointers. But you're going to want to make sure you have good camp gear in there and stuff like that too. It's going to work for you. Stands. Okay, I'm a mobile hunter. I only need one stand and one set of sticks. That's all I need. Now, I bring a backup, um, but very rarely do I need to use that second set. But if somebody else uh, has a stand up, they put their one stand up. It kind of that my backup becomes kind of the community backup is what it becomes. So if somebody has a stand up, they kill an animal, they left that stand there, but they don't want to go back to it that next morning, they'll grab my secondary stand set and they'll run that for that morning and then they'll go get their other one down and do all that stuff. But it saves them from having to go back to the same spot. Um, so it comes in very handy. So, But if you're somebody that plans to go out there spend a few days of scouting and hanging five stands and leaving them there, you better make sure you got five stands. So figure out that scenario and what you got to do. Not only do you, if you're going to have five stands, and if you're going to have five stands each and you got two guys going, you better start thinking about bringing a trailer, okay? Because five stands each, that's 10 tree stands, 10 sticks um, set up, and you're going to throw that plus gear in the back of, in the bed of a truck, you're going to run out of room really, really fast. So a trailer would come in handy. But you need to figure that stuff out. Find out what's going to work for you. Your bows that you're bringing, okay? Traditional guys, we usually, even in the compound days, you know, we, we always brought a backup bow. You know, anything can happen, okay? The horror stories every year I hear about somebody, uh, they left their bow sitting there, they took their bow and they put it on the bed of their, on the cap of their truck, and then they drove off and forgot it up there, and next thing you know, it's down the road, all beat up and broken and not working right. Um, people have slammed bow tips not realizing it. They put the bow in the back of the seat of the truck. It slides down. It's dark. Somebody closes the door. Snap. They take the bow tip off. So these things happen. Smashing them in tailgates. Things happen. You want to have a backup bow, in my opinion. I don't go on any hunting trip without two bows. And that's also why I shoot the exact 
same bows. My bows, if you know me, are made as clones. I have, um, like my classics that I'm shooting right now, my Northern Mist Classic bows. I have two of them that are exactly 64 inches. They're both 57 pounds at my 26 inch drawling. They are 100% identical bows. And they travel with me every single place I go. Makes life a lot easier. I, same arrows, same everything work out of them. Two bows, one tube, life is good, problem solved. You need to figure that out for you and how that's going to work. At, le at the very least, spare bow strings, spare knock points, that kind of stuff. At the very least, you need to have with you. Spares bag. Spares bag is important. See, when you're hunting at home and uh, you say you go out and your buddy kills a deer and then you go out and you track with him for, say, you're out there for six, eight hours, you burn through 12 batteries in your flashlights and headlamps and things like that, uh, you found a deer, you went through your rubber gloves and all this stuff and uh, game bags or whatever you had to use to get him out of there and you got that animal out of there, well then when you get home, you can put new batteries in your pack, get all your stuff together, put new gloves in, new game bags, and you're ready to roll. When you're on a hunting trip, you don't have a home with all these supplies there. So you make what's called a spares bag. Spares bag is going to have extra game bags, extra another dozen batteries that you need, uh, spare uh, game processing gloves, spare Havilon blades, spare, 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 spare of everything. Spare tabs, spare arm guard, spare uh, hat, spare whatever you need. It's a bag with spare components that you might actually need on that trip. Spare compass or whatever, but you want spares. Build that bag so you have that thing ready to go. Animal recovery is another one that not many people think about. If you guys kill one, are you going to drag it? Well, if you're living in Michigan um, or somewhere that's flat, okay, and you kill an animal there and you're used to, you know, just taking it and throwing your rope around his neck and putting a stick through the handle and you guys just drag it all out of there, it's all fine and dandy. That works great. Try doing that in Kansas. Try doing that in Iowa. Try doing that in uh, parts of Missouri. Try doing that in Kentucky. Try doing that anywhere there's hills, especially when you get into the, you know, to the bluffs and stuff like that. There is no dragging deer in those kinds of places. You need to have a solution for that. Maybe a game cart. Maybe a, a sled, a jet sled, phenomenal, works great, use it many times. Or maybe you're going to need to pack those animals out on your back. That's what we do 99% of the time. It's a lot better. But if you're going to pack them, now you're talking frame pack. Okay, something that's going to be able to carry that meat. You need to get that ahead of time. You have to have it. You want to actually set it up with 80 pounds of sandbags and stuff like that in there so you can get it adjusted right, fit right, and set up for you. Are you going to hunt with that frame pack on you and use it as a regular pack too? Or are you going to leave it in the car as a frame pack and then just come back and get it out of the truck after you kill an animal? You have to sort these things out. Now is the time to figure out that animal recovery plan that you want to go for. Meat care is another one. Are you going to have it processed right there in the state where you're at, in that town where you're going to be camping by? Speaking of camp gear, another thing you need to look at is camp locations. Are there any places around there can you camp? Can you camp right on the public land in the parking lots? Like some states allowed, you have to go to a designated camping area uh, to a state park. What's the options there? But with the meat care, you have to figure that out. Are you having it processed there? If you kill one on day five, Will that place have it processed and done for you before you're ready to leave on day seven? You have to know this ahead of time by calling that places around there that you're planning on using. This is the time to get this stuff in order. Um, are you going to bone it out and then just put it in a cooler, or at least quarter it and then put it in a cooler and take it home to your processor? If so, you better have a cooler big enough to hold that much deer meat if you're doing it. Um, so that's a, you got to take that into consideration. Do you have room in your truck for a couple of coolers in there with all your five stands and all the gear that you're going to add in your tents and your camping gear? Maybe you got to keep in mind, maybe you're going to be considering, if you don't already have access to a trailer, renting a small 4x6 U-Haul trailer. Might cost you 200 bucks, split two ways, that's 100 bucks a person for the week. Probably very worth it to have that access. Um, and, you know, and it also, that trailer, if you're camping, gives you a place to lock your spare bows, your extra stands, all of this stuff. You can put it right in that trailer and then padlock it at your campsite and that trailer, is, all your, your gear is locked, nobody can steal it. It's a great idea. It's one of the reasons we use a trailer. Um, but you need to figure that. And then you also need to check out local laws when it comes to meat care. Here in Michigan, it is against the law to bring in any bones from a deer, ok, 
okay? Any bones from a, a deer harvested out of state, we cannot bring in their bones, we cannot bring in any of the spinal column, we cannot even bring in the, the head unless it's completely boiled out of all, of all brain matter and completely cleaned out. Has to be done that way or full taxidermy amount because of uh, CWD and all this stuff. We don't, they don't want it coming here anymore. So in order to bring it into Michigan, I have to bone these animals out 100% and boil the skulls out. Cape the skulls out completely and boil the skulls out before I can bring them into Michigan. Know your laws that relate to where you're hunting and to where you're going to be in your own state for bringing them back in. It's important. People get busted for this every year out of state hunts. In Michigan, they sit there on the side of I-75 and all these roads, and they watch these come by. And if they think it looks like, you know, if they see a pickup truck covered in mud with a bunch of stands in there and gear stacked up in the bed of that truck, they pull them over. If they find out that that deer was killed in Ohio, and, it's not, and they're bringing back a deer without or that has any of those bones or is breaking the laws with that, those people are in serious trouble here. They don't take lightly to that. So know your laws. Figure your gear. This is step nine. All right, number 10, preparing your vehicle for this trip. This is a big one, and very few people actually think about it. It will come back to haunt you. It will make you shuffle in and scramble in and cause all kinds of issues. This is an important one. I've learned this through experience, okay? Preparing your vehicle. First one, maintenance. This is a big deal. All right, you're going to be a thousand miles or 800 miles away from home. Things are going to, you don't want to deal with anything. So before you leave for that trip, make sure your tires are good. You don't know what the roads are going to be like there. Are they going to be dirt? Are they going to be washed out? Are they going to be rutted? Is it going to be rainy and then they're going to be miserable? Um, are you going to be going down back roads where you're going to get snagged and into problems and, and all kinds of stuff? Is Are you used to soft sand where you are and where you're going? It's peanut butter mud and you're not used to it. It's going to cake onto everything. Turn your tires into slicks and you're going to be stuck in no time. You don't know. So maintenance-wise... Make sure your tires are really good, okay, and taken care of and ready to roll and got good life on them. You're going to be carrying a lot of weight in your vehicle. Make sure your tires are able to handle that without having blowouts. Oil change. Get an oil change done before you leave. Again, it could be 2,000 miles you're putting on there. If you you get nothing worse than getting on a, on a trip or heading out to go on a trip, then you get 25 miles or 100 miles into a 1,000-mile trip and your change oil light comes on. Okay, and then you're in trouble. You gotta fight. You're gonna have to give up hunting time to get that oil changed. Okay, um, battery. Make sure the battery is good. Make sure you got jumper cables with you as well too. I don't even have that on there, but have jumper cables with you. Check the belts. When you start getting miles up and start getting into these things, you got to make sure that your belts are going to be in good shape. It's real easy. Pop the hood, inspect them, look for any cracking and stuff in those belts. If they're bad, replace them. Nothing worse than being at 3 a.m. in the middle of Missouri on your way to Kansas and having a serpentine belt go out, and then you've lost the whole next day of hunting because you are now stuck there on the side of the road sleeping, waiting till morning, and then you're going to call Uber to come pick you up and take you to the nearest O'Reilly's or whichever store has it, and then an Uber to bring you back to your car, and you're going to have to need the tools to replace that serpentine belt. Been there, done that, telling you this stuff is from experience. Check those belts before you go. Check the brakes. Okay, make sure brakes are good. Again, you're going to have a vehicle that is heavily loaded. A lot of these vehicles you're going to be running may be over payload capacity. All right, you may not even know you're doing it, but you're going to be loading that vehicle down pretty heavy. Make sure the brakes are good so that you're going to be in good shape. Not to mention, you get 100 miles into that trip and all of a sudden you hit the brakes and it's squeaking because your little wear indicators finally that day decided to hit on there. And so now for the whole entire trip, you're constantly squeaking the whole time. You don't want to deal with it. Check your brakes. Make sure they're good. Any other issues you have, make sure they are taken care of on this vehicle before this trip so they do not interfere with hunting time. Okay? Next one, packing. Packing. Dry run this stuff. Dry run it for 30 miles. Okay? This is kind of my rule. What I mean by that, you and your buddy... A couple weeks before that trip, and you got all this stuff in your garage, all your gears together, everything's ready. Put it all in, load it how you're going to load that truck to go. Make sure everything fits, make sure you know where it is. Once you get it all in and everything fits like you want to, take a picture of it so you remember. Get it strapped down, get it tied down, and then go do a 30-mile trip with it. 15 miles out, 15 miles back, include highway. 
That way you make sure you can see what's working, what's not. Is this bag opening? Is this going to be a problem here? If you were tarping it to keep it dry, does your tarp stay down or blow up? Is it rattling? What's going? You can figure out all your issues by doing a quick packing dry run. Might take you an hour to do it but it's worth it rather than on the day you're ready to leave at three o'clock in the morning and you're trying to load everything up or the night before and you realize I can't fit everything. What am I gonna do? This stuff doesn't all fit in a truck. Know this stuff ahead of time, okay? Maybe you think you can fit it all, but you can't. Now you gotta buy yourself a hitch carrier, okay? But if you buy a hitch carrier, plug it in the back, you're gonna be all set. But that hitch carrier is gonna cover your license plate. So now you gotta either take the plate off and put it in the back window. Oh, but you got gear stacked up so you can't see it there. So the solution is to take a picture of your license plate, to run that on a USB drive down to Walmart or CVS or whatever and have them print it out as an 8x10, take that picture of your license and put it into one of those plastic sleeves and tape it on the back of your coolers or whatever is on the back of your, uh, um, on your rack back there and now your license plate is visible from the back. A lot of places will let you do that. But you need to dry run to figure all of this stuff out. So do the dry run of packing, drive it for 30 miles, make sure it's going to be all good. And then recovery. Again, you're going somewhere you've never been before and you are going to be in the woods, all right? Some of the places are basically nice dirt roads, come to a parking spot that's maintained, you get out, you hike in from there. Other places are miles of back roads, power lines, dirt roads, things like that that you could be in trouble, you know, un unmaintained roads. You want recovery stuff. I've done many videos on this. We're going to keep it simple. Mini shovel. Okay, I have videos with this stuff. I'll probably link some of this stuff in this video for you as well too. A mini shovel, tow straps, make sure you got tow points on your vehicle. Your trailer hitch is not a tow point, or okay? You cannot. You go wrapping a tow strap around your hitch, you'll be amazed how many times that hitch ball on that side, they're made to carry trailers. You put a tow strap on there and have somebody yank you, they'll snap that ball off and it'll come right through the car and it'll kill whoever's towing it. Um, so a, a trailer hitch is not a tow point. Make sure you have a, if you're using a pickup truck and you got a hitch, plug in a hitch with the pin. It's got this designed for it, all right? Um, so you want to have tow points, front and back. Make sure you got them on there. If your vehicle doesn't have any tow points, say you're in a, in a SUV, um, a car, or something like that that doesn't have tow points, they make a tow bridle, okay? It's got J-hooks and T-hooks and all this, and it goes right under, it hooks on your frame, and it's got a main point, you hook on, and it works great. I'll put a link to it below for you. But you need a shovel, tow straps, tow points, and a saw. That saw will let you cut branches to shove them under the wheels, to give yourself traction boards to get out of there, whatever you want. Traction boards, I've done videos on these as well too. They're not expensive, they don't take up a lot of room, and they are going to work fantastic for a lot of different stuck situations um, off-road. Bog out is another cool thing. Now mine is on order, I do not have it yet, but this thing is pretty sweet. It turns your tires of your vehicle into an actual winch and will pull you out. It's a rope ladder. That you lay that you connect to your tire and it comes out and you tie it off to a tree goes to both front or rear tires and then you get in the car and as you hit reverse it will actually roll right around this these ladders you'll drive and they'll roll around your tires your wheels become the winch and they pull you right out of there pretty amazing not not super cheap but not very not horribly expensive i don't remember what they were uh I want to say just about basically 200 bucks, I think they were, but very worth it in my opinion because now your vehicle is an actual winch that can go front and reverse. So it's a great feature, but that's something to check out. Bog out, bogout.com. Um, but you need that recovery aspect. Last one is security gear theft security. I have been very fortunate. I've never had anything stolen out of the back of my truck, never had anything stolen out of my camps, um, never had any issues like that whatsoever, but I do hear horror stories of it. Having a way to securely lock stuff. Um, if you're using a generator to run your camp, you want to be able to lock that generator because generators have a tendency to walk away um, from things like that. Put a Yeti cooler in the back of your pickup. I've tr just, just, I, I can't wait for people to do this because um, the horror stories that are out there are tremendous. So if you want to be one of those, those people, do it. Buy yourself a nice Yeti cooler and then put it in the back of your truck and then go on an out-of-state hunt and see how well that stays in the back of your truck. 
okay? It's a Yeti cooler. People realize that they're two, three, four, five hundred dollar coolers and they're in high demand and you have one sitting in the back of your truck. You might as well just take a stack of, of hundred dollar bills and, and, and tape it to you, you put it underneath your windshield, your windshield wiper. It's the same concept, okay? Leave the Yeti at home, grab yourself a Coleman cooler that you can leave in the bed of your truck and nobody's going to take it because it's a $60 cooler and they don't need it. All right, that's my opinion. And if you have a Yeti and you want to use it, again, don't get mad at me. Have a way to securely lock that Yeti to your vehicle or wherever it is so that it does not get taken away from you. All right, there's just some things that, like I said, those Yeti coolers, they disappear from trucks all the time. Um, and if you have one, and somebody sees it, you're drawing attention. If they're going to take your cooler, what else do you have there that they're going to take as well too? Because now they're already committed. Um, so gear security is a good a good kind of thing to think about. Again, might be better for you too if you don't already have a enclosed trailer. Rent a U-Haul trailer. When my trailer got hit by a deer on the way out to Kansas last year. We were able to limp it out there, and then the insurance totaled it and took it from us out there. So we had all of our camp gear and everything there. We went and rented a U-Haul. I, I was on the phone. It took two minutes. Called, reserved it right through the internet, and then I called them and said, yep, yeah. they said it's there. And then when we were getting ready to leave, we went and picked up that U-Haul trailer. It cost us 200 bucks, you know, to use it for a few days, you know. So it's not expensive to run a U-Haul trailer, and they lock and they're secure. So that may be a good option for you for these kind of trips. All your gear can be inside there. Dry, protected, safe. It's not a bad idea to do. Um, and if you're doing that, get yourself one of those little ball lock clamp lock so when it's in camp you can lock that u-haul trailer so nobody even tries to take your trailer okay or lock it to a tree with a cable whatever you want to do but gear security in my opinion never been an issue for me but it is something that you may want to consider and keep in mind so there you go but that's preparing your vehicle for this trip all right finally last one attitude this is everything here okay you've done everything you've got all the packing done you've done everything there is to it you have everything prepared you have to go in with the right attitude. Let's put it this way. Things are going to go wrong. Vehicles are going to break down. You're going to hit deer. You're going to get stuck. You're going to get there and people are going to ruin your trip for you. Somebody else is hunting in the spot you want to go to. They just logged it and so that's gone. Roads flooded out. Bridge is under construction. You can't get through to here. Um, there's going to be so many variables that are going to come into play on this trip. If you don't have the right attitude, it's going to be, it can be miserable for you. You have to be willing to adapt. You have to be willing to change, roll with the punches, uh, whatever you got to do. But you need to be strong-willed. You have to have the right attitude and mindset to do this. And you got to have that kind of personality. If you don't, it will be difficult. So know that it's going to be difficult and there's going to be things that are going to come up already so that you're prepared for when they do. When that deer hit my trailer and then all of a sudden we watched the fender go off and the tire started smoking and squealing and it was bent axle and we were in trouble and it's 3.30 in the morning and we're stuck on the side of the road somewhere in Missouri and we still got 600 miles to go with a broken trailer before we get to camp and we want to be able to hunt the next morning. We're like, as soon as it happens, boom, it's, we're in trouble. We pull over on the side of the road. Me and John look at each other and we just kind of laugh. We, we've been here. We've been here. I've had trucks catch on fire in, in Missouri in the middle of a farm field. So we got stuck in my 2009 F-150 just went up in flames and burned to the ground right there, melted away and done. Um, completely gone. We've, you know, you name it, it has happened to us. Things are going to go wrong on these trips, all right? We had to scurry. We lost all of our stands. It, it happened instantly. We lost a ton of gear. We were running around to Walmart and Farm and Fleet trying to buy any ladder stand we could or any portable stand. Trying to, We were doing everything we could. We had to rent a car, then rent a U-Haul. Um, we had to do a whole bunch of things, okay? It's all part of the game. Things are going to happen. Things are going to go wrong. Keep your right personality and your mindset adjust, adapt to it, solve it. When we saw that that tire was hit, we knew we were in trouble, got out and looked at it. You know, again, you keep that right mindset. Instead of getting pissed and kicking things and throwing a fit and yelling, it's like, okay, solve. How do we solve? Okay, there's an exit up there. Let's limp it up there and get off at that exit. We get off at that exit, there's a car wash right there. Let's go to that car wash. That car wash has got huge uh, cement beams right by the car wash entrance. Cool, let's park it here. Run my come along, my big uh, wife got more power puller coming along around there under the trailer hook it to the front of this wheel start jerking it bend that axle and then take that that here's the trailer and that axle is like this and bend that axle in 
to enough that we could get that to roll. We didn't get it all the way, but got it close enough from, from this to like that. So then we could go, okay, it's rolling now. Take it. Now we can start driving. Finish that trip out. Drive for 15 miles or 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Pull over. Check the temperature of that tire. It's not bad. Drive for 30 miles. Pull over. Check the temperature of the tire. It's getting hot. Sit here for 10 minutes. Let it cool down. Okay, it's cool enough. Drive it. And then, oh, okay, 30 minutes. Cool it down. Whatever you got to do. You roll with the punches. Roll with how things are going to be. Attitude, 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 attitude. That is what is going to make this trip phenomenal for you and for the people that are on it with you. Okay, Things will go wrong. Issues will come up. There's a lot of moving parts that you're trying to deal with. Understand that some of those parts are going to break down or fail. You have to be the smart one to remain your keep keep your composure remain calm and solve through it having a toolkit in your truck is a very valuable thing i've done videos on this toolkit for your vehicles you know that kind of stuff for to have in your boat truck trailer put one together it may cost you uh, you know 150 bucks to build it but it will come in so handy i promise you okay have the you know get this stuff done and have the right attitude and mentality when you get there because it's going to be great but some things are going to come up. If you're one of those people that, you know, schedule your day in five minute increments. And if this, if something happens at 10.05 that doesn't match and your whole day screwed off. If you're somebody that's going to stomp your feet and, and walk around mad and pissed at the world. You're not, this isn't for you. You have to be adaptable. And you have to be willing to roll with it. And you got to be creative. So there you go. That's what it takes to plan an out of state hunt. This is whole, you know, A to Z, everything in between, the whole deal. So Get out there, make it happen. Go enjoy it. Thanks for watching. Talk to you soon.